the problem isn't that you can't find the information. The problem isn't that um, you don't have access to the resources that are within you. The problem is the roots to your resistance. This resistance to changing, that's the biggest problem. With anxiety, we've, I mean, we live in the digital era. We live in information overload and we've got programs, this and that, we've got the people, we've got everything we need to heal. But many times we confuse ourselves. The conscious mind is confused because the subconscious mind wants to maintain what's been familiar. So the conscious mind gets more and more depleted, confused and out of the picture throughout the day because the subconscious just wants to maintain what it knows best. And with anxiety, what do we know best? Trauma, childhood and adult trauma. What do we know best? Fear, okay. Um, what do we know best? Anger, repressed rage. What, those are the things we know. We know suffering, right? We know suffering. And because we know suffering so very well, any time something peaceful comes into our life, we don't know what to do with it, especially health. You know, a lot of people have never felt healthy. They don't know what good health is. What is it, right? And I have a general idea of what good health is, right? You know, I'm feeling good and I'm happy and my body feels healthy, but because it's such an unfamiliar idea, the subconscious mind doesn't take it on. So the roots of your resistance to change is the problem, not the fact that you don't have the right information, okay? Now here's a couple questions that you want to write down related to the roots of your anxiety, the roots of your resistance, sorry, right? This resistance to change, this resistance, because it just shows up all the time, it's showing up all the time. Question number one. What does anxiety do for me? What does anxiety do for me? By the way, this guy, Matt Warren, amazing, his insight. Great to have you, Matt. Number one, what does anxiety do for me? And a lot of people, first impression, first impression is like, anxiety does nothing for me. Okay, hold on, hold on, right? Don't trust your first impressions over anything. Don't trust your feelings all the time. Don't trust your thoughts all the time. It's a very important rule. What does anxiety do for me? I'll tell you what anxiety did for me. Anxiety for me kept me in a place where I didn't have to be responsible for many things I didn't want to be responsible for in my life. Anxiety allowed me to work less. I was able to cut my hours at work. Anxiety um, made me feel significant towards other people. I felt loved. I felt like I was cared for. Something that I felt like I didn't have when I was a kid. Many times, these needs, and everything we do is because needs that are unmet. Right? Why are people sad? Why are people anxious? Why are people angry? Why are people this, that? Why do you have anxiety? Why do you continue to have anxiety? Why do you continue to move in this direction? It's not, an, it's not a life sentence, but we treat it like it is. Okay, anxiety is not a life sen sentence, but we feel like it is. And unconsciously, we, we attach ourselves to this anxiety because it does provide us with things. Things that we feel like we're not gonna have when we heal. So what do we do? We go back to what's familiar, anxiety, fear, suffering, self-sabotage. So that's the first question. The second question you want to ask yourself is, why is it so hard for me to let go of this mood fully? Why is it so hard for me to let go of this mood fully? Because it is a mood. It starts with ideas. Ideas turn into beliefs. Beliefs turn into actions actions, emotions, and of course, this could be intertwined in many different ways, but in the end, you're in a mood, right? You're in this mood, this fearful mood that's just constant. And with anxiety, you're looking for that one brief moment throughout the day where you're like, oh my God, wow, that light just got a little bit brighter and I like that feeling, okay? So, 
the next question is that. Why is it so hard for me to let go of this mood fully? Now, again, don't trust your first reactions to these questions. Because a lot of people will say this is just, you know, X or it's Y and and, uh, and, and why would I want to have anxiety in my life? Why this, why that? Um, but I want you guys to go a lot deeper than that if you can, all right? And if it's freezing, guys, don't worry. This is gonna be a post video out there um, at the end. You're gonna to get to watch it as well. I'm gonna put it on YouTube. Uh, hopefully it's not freezing for too many people though. Third question, write this down. This is about the roots of your resistance to change. Number three is what keeps bringing me back to worry? What keeps bringing me back to worry? Is it a sense of identity? It's who I am. Right. Is it a sense of my personality? This is just the way life is from now on. Do I feel like, do I feel like I have built relationships with people throughout the months and the years and they just know me as so? And to change for myself and to them would be too big, you know, an option. Right? A lot of people don't change because of what they feel uh, may come in the way between them and other people. Right? And a lot of people don't change because of the thoughts and the ideas of other people towards them. I don't change. I've already built the relationship with people. They know me as an anxious person. I'm feeling significant because of them. I feel like there's a sense of certainty in my life. I don't like the world of the unknown, like AJ just said. And the truth is, is that that world that we call the unknown is part of life. And if you cannot embrace the unknown, as much as you're searching for certainty in your life, you're never gonna heal, right? And that really is the truth, things that are unknown. And, and the biggest unknown is dying. And until we place a new meaning over dying, nothing's gonna change. I mean, we can't live until we get comfortable with the idea of passing on, period. We're not gonna, we're, not, we're really not gonna start living until we can put this gigantic fear aside and to say that this cycle of life comes and goes. The body fades, but the energy continues, whatever it may be. You gotta play with the idea of dying. You gotta throw it up and catch it. You gotta juggle it. You gotta make friends with it, right? This is truth. And for a lot of people out there, it's very overwhelming to think this way, but this is reality. Right? You are not going to start living your life until you start to find yourself in situations, thinking patterns, emotions, people, circumstances that are different because different is the unknown and the unknown is uncertainty and uncertainty is your key to healing. Uncertainty holds the key to healing. If you want to heal, show me. Show me you want to heal, okay? By embracing the uncertainty and going directly towards it. See your troubles as training. Write that down. No more wishing away each day. And Andrea, that is perfect. I love, I love that. Um, Michael loves the unknown now. Interesting. Mirza, you're very welcome. Uh, we'll go at the end of the, uh, the, the session, we'll go over the buddy system one more time, just so it's super clear. Um, see your troubles as training. A lot of people run into troubles and they say, I am this, or my life will always be this, or this always happens to me. Instead of those voices, why don't you go ahead and begin filling yourself with different perceptions over what just took place. And the truth is that your troubles are training. Okay, I have a trouble, whether that be a trouble in the external world. Okay, Matt, tons of anxiety is generated out of resistance to reality. And um, the trouble could be external like your car could break down. Your trouble could be external in terms of someone saying something to you that you don't agree with, criticism, whatever it may be. The trouble could be getting fired from work external troubles. Then there are internal troubles, feelings that you don't like. Okay, I don't want to feel this way. Thoughts that you don't want to think. Automatic actions that you don't want to partake in anymore. No matter what the trouble is, see it as a training opportunity. 
And the truth I've found is that when we can begin to take lessons from things that we, um, we find are bad or have been bad in our lives, like when we go back and we say, wow, I took this from that and this lesson from it. I'm glad it happened in this way. I should have seen it in this manner instead. When we can begin to take lessons from those troubling experiences, many times our perceptions over those experiences change and our emotional state starts to change as well. So it's very important that you take lessons from all the events that are going on in your life so that you can in fact perceive them in the way that your new identity wants to perceive them, okay? Asking your bodily symptoms what you, and let's just focus on the bodily symptoms for a second. Asking your bodily symptoms what you can give and what you can take away is very important. Hey, bodily symptom, what can I give you more of? What can I take away? Instead of going about your day wishing that the symptoms wouldn't be there, right? I wish this wasn't there, just go away. Why are you still around? The symptoms, no matter what kind of symptoms there are, are all messages from your inner child saying, I'm not comfortable right now. This situation is too familiar to what took place in the past. Therefore, I don't want to be overwhelmed again. And because I, the inner child within me, doesn't want to feel overwhelmed again, I need to communicate this message to the conscious mind in some way. And the way it does that is through your symptoms. So if we can say, hey, bodily symptom, therefore, inner child, what can I give you more of? And what can I take away? What's a good example of this? Well, I can give you more understanding, more truth and more self-love. I can give you those things because I'm sensing that, and I'll go with my intuition on this, I'm sensing that this bodily symptom comes with a need that isn't being met. The inner child is always searching for that need that hasn't been met, right? And what can I take away? I can take away anger. I got a bodily symptom. I could take away the anger that's connected to that symptom. The anger over what people did to me. The anger over what wasn't given to me. I can take those away now because I've identified them. You cannot overcome anxiety until you identify what's causing your anxiety. So what's causing your anxiety? It's definitely not your boss. It's definitely not your spouse. It's definitely not the, the fact that your car broke down. It's definitely not what, what took place last week, the panic attack. It's none of those things. It's the vast majority of the time. What took place between conception and the age of seven? That's the roots of your anxiety today. And that inner child communicates to you of those experiences around your symptoms. So now that you know that, okay, I want to stop for a second. And I just want to see where everybody is. Go ahead. Questions on what we just discussed. Because we can't move forward, guys, until we're truly clear. Comment below. Truly clear on what just went down, okay, what just went down. What went down is we recognize that it's the roots to our resistance to change that's the biggest problem, okay? The conscious mind is overwhelmed because the subconscious wants to maintain what it knows best, suffering. We know that now. We know that our troubles are training. We know that now. And we also know that we can ask our bodily symptoms what it needs from us, and what we need to take away, rather than wishing these symptoms away each and every day, or distracting ourselves. A lot of people do this, they distract themselves, hoping that the symptom goes away temporarily, but always shows up again. Trudy says, age three comes back a lot when I address my symptoms. Andra says, I find that hard 
uh, that hard to work through because I don't remember much from my childhood. Now, this is important. Can the reframing still work without specifically remembering a situation? Reframing can work. Um, now, here's how I approach reframing, okay? Number one is we reframe the past traumatic memory that has everything to do with what you may be feeling today. So any moments of overwhelm, any past moments of freezing. If a person cannot remember, and that, and it's very rare that people can't remember. I mean, consciously, next to impossible. But when you're in a different brainwave state, you have more access to what's going on in your subconscious mind, your infinite memory storage system. And so when I place somebody in a state where their mind and body are both relaxed, they have access, they go, wow, I never saw that, never realized that, it's the age of four or five. So don't get so caught up in the fact that you consciously can't remember because literally you shouldn't. Your subconscious will not get the conscious to remember these things because it doesn't want you to be traumatized again. But spending time in nature, meditation, you know, even self-hypnosis, even guided hypnosis, um, any of these types of things can help. Reiki, body work, massages, all of these things can help you to access the roots of your anxiety, zero to seven. Now let's say that somebody can't remember a memory. Okay, that's totally fine. What do you do then? You go directly to the body. Okay, you work somatically in that case. Where in your body are you storing the fear? Where in your body are you storing the trauma? Where in your body are you storing the overwhelm or the anger or the sadness, whatever it may be? CBD bath bombs are amazing, Michael says. So you go to the body and you find out what's being stored in what part of your body and you begin partaking in certain techniques and exercises that gets you to begin releasing that stuff out of your body, okay, and replacing it with something new. It's like taking the old files on your computer, putting them in the trash can, hitting delete, and placing new files on your desktop. That's literally what you're doing. Now, let's say that somebody can't remember or they can't even um, recognize where in their body they're storing these emotions, repressed emotions, the stored dis undischarged energy. Then you go to color. Then you go to color. Sometimes you go to sound or vibration. Color, sound, vibration to work through what's stored in your brain and your body and your spirit based on what you're feeling today. So I'll tell people to run colors through their body and run colors out of their body. I'll tell them to begin hearing certain uh, sounds that are connected to healing and, and letting go of old sounds, that kind of thing, vibrations. So we need to understand that reframing always comes with a solution for anybody and everybody. It's either the memory, or it's the body, or it's the color, sound, that sort of thing, or it's a combination of all those things. Lucky you, we're gonna do a reframing process today. I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense? Comment below. Comment below, comment below. I love your comments, guys. Someone had a tough week? Good, lots of lessons to be learned, right? All our organs store emotion. Well said, Michael. But the reframing keeps happening after EMDR session. So this week was a really was a roller coaster. That's awesome. Keep going. Keep going. The key behind reframing, uh, whether it's EFT, EMDR, I mean, this is all a lot of body work. There is a lot of energy work. There is fantastic. Um, a lot of this is based on the relentlessness. It's many times you don't get the result that you want right off the bat, right away, right? It's relentlessness, it's persevering through it, that sort of thing. But I wanna give you a deep understanding of where you're healing, where, where your time must be spent in order for you to heal the way you consciously want to. 
Amanda, dire need of direction. Um, if anybody wants to go to YouTube and look up, and just all you gotta do is put up the keyword, plan anxiety guy. There's a video there at the top, the structure to healing. Boom, Amanda needs that and someone can post it. Uh, that'd be great. Plan anxiety guy, top of the list. Um, also, we got the End the Anxiety Program, Life Mastery Program, you got everything you need. The structure, the foundation, the techniques, everything you need is in that program. Lots of meditation, yes. Makes sense. Okay, so everybody's pretty much caught up in the what we've discussed so far, right? Man, New York, uh, it's, yeah, it's, t it's tough. It's tough, Michael. Uh, uh, the book's coming out soon, 2020, hopefully in the beginning of the year. That's my main focus right now. I, I've created this book based on the years and years and years of what I believe is best. And the title is quite, uh, quite interesting, so uh, I'm not going to give it out right away. But Jum, you got the, uh, the link there. Thank you so much. New York, New York. I'd love to go to New York. I'd love to go to New York. I've always wanted to go to the... Uh, Madison Square Garden to watch a New York Knicks game and I feel like it's like the mecca of basketball as well I'm a big uh, big uh, soccer fan as well so we'll see we'll see but it's so great to have you guys here with me metaphors guys let's get a deeper understanding as far as your transition your transformation that's taking place right now right and then we're gonna go into an emotional reframing process I'm excited I'm looking forward to presenting you with the book, Kara. It's going to be Kara, Kara, Kira, Kara. Uh, it's going to be powerful. The Knicks suck. I know they suck. I know. I know. Uh, should you stop reframing if you feel it worked or do you keep up with it regardless? Hana, I've literally reframed probably over 10,000 times. Um, I would say reframe the same event over and over and over again until you can in your heart feel like a shift has occurred. When you can perceive that event differently, when you can forgive other people, when the meaning has changed, when you have discharged the emotions that come with that event, when you can look at it and say, I'm done with it. I'm literally done with it. It's not interesting to me. It's like beating a dead horse. I don't want to reframe this anymore. You're done. Move on to another memory. Move on to another event. Reframing is a daily process. Reframing is a daily process. And you'll see people touch on reframing. Uh, Dr. John Sarno, absolutely fantastic. Um, Peter Levine, fantastic. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score. Everybody should read that book. Um, tons and tons of guys out there. Brent Baum, David Snyders, you name it. I mean, these guys are... They preach very similar methods or similar approaches to what I preach, just in different ways, which makes it unique and beautiful. But we are all preaching the idea of safely reconnecting with the inner child and renegotiating past events, right? Metaphors. Metaphor number one comes down to the slow train, guys. I'm glad you're here for this because this is very, very important. I love, I love sharing metaphors and stories. Metaphor number one, write it down, is the slow train, which identifies the transition from the old to the new, right? The old you to the new you. Old, new. And the slow train, think about a train. You're going on a train. Doo, train is about to move. And the train has been going in a negative direction for quite some time now. And you know what happens when a train picks up speed. It's very difficult to stop. Especially, we're talking about the transition, the beginning journey away from anxiety and towards a brand new identity, right? So I want you to see this transition as you being the train moving in one direction for longer than you think you've been moving in that direction. Remember, zero to seven years of age. And you've been going in that direction for quite some time. And all of a sudden, here you are as the adult saying, I want to go somewhere different. And so the train, with, with its squeaky brakes, I mean, oh, God, right? Squeaky brakes, the train begins to slow down. 
to the point where it stops. And how fast does it stop? It stops not very fast. It takes time before that train stops. And then once the train stops, you are literally in between identities. This is where people gain tremendous insights into how they've conditioned themselves consciously and unconsciously into anxiety. This is when the train has stopped. They start to go, holy smokes. I brought myself here, knowingly and unknowingly. And these are the things that continue to fuel my anxiety and my disorder, right? These are the distraction methods, whatever I'm utilizing. And there's a whole lot of insight there. And the person needs to make a decision at this point, whether to embrace the new, the uncertain, the unknown, or continue going in the same direction where that train has been going for quite some time, right? If you embrace the new, it's going to be very uncomfortable, period. It's going to be very uncomfortable, at least in the beginning stages. And because it's uncomfortable, it's the exact direction you need to go because you're looking for comfort no matter where you are, which is causing you more anxiety. Everybody that has anxiety right now wants to live a comfortable life, a comfortable life. I just want to be comfortable, right? I want to go through my day comfortable. Okay, but comfort doesn't really go hand in hand with change. Change is very uncomfortable. When you start a new career, it's uncomfortable. When you go up, you know, to, you know, your, your wife or your husband and they're at the bar or whatever, right? It's very uncomfortable. Hey, you come here often? How are things? You want a drink? I'm uncomfortable. Shifts from anxiety to new identity is no different. It's uncomfortable. Okay, so the slow train metaphor as you go into another direction needs to be identified. This is who you are. Okay. I'm going to suggest that nobody here looks for comfort, but they embrace the discomfort that comes with change instead. Embrace the discomfort that comes with change rather than looking to feel comfortable day in and day out. Okay? And if you do this consistently, you're going to find that um, the world that you've been running from for quite some time, right, isn't as scary as your mind has made it up to be up to now. Okay. The second metaphor, guys. Okay, let's go through a couple comments here first. Uncertainty may be different, but it will have a much better view than the way I've been going, Colby. Good insights. Embrace the discomfort, Nick says, yes, sir. Some aha moments are very unpleasant, but so needed. Yes, we're in it together. We really are. Sometimes there's no event. The event is the panic attack, Nick. Love your insights always. Um, some people talk about New York, New York, New York. So that metaphor makes sense, doesn't it? It's kind of this transition from the old to the new. The second metaphor is the water balloon effect. The water balloon effect. And just so you guys know, today is about, is it going to be an hour and a half to two hours? Right? So there you go. Right? Probably a first. So get your water, get your tea, hang around. Um, you take me to the next game, Michael? Um, the next one is the water balloon effect. And you see this with uh, health anxiety sufferers most of the time. Recognizing the need for sufferers to eliminate their bodily symptoms and having them show up in different body parts. So you'll see people focusing on the symptoms, symptoms, symptoms. I like the Yankees. When you focus on the symptoms so much, and oh, if only this symptom could go away, right? If only this feeling in my body could go away. If only this one emotion could go away, I'd be free. Not necessarily, okay? Um, it w because there are causes to the symptom. 
The water balloon effect. When you squeeze a water, water balloon, it comes out somewhere else. Squeeze it there, it comes out somewhere. Squeeze it over here, it comes out on the top. Squeeze it there, it comes out on the bottom. That's why you see people, um, when they go into surgery, for example, um, phantom limp pain. When you see people go into surgery and a particular part of their body is being surgically removed, okay, for whatever case that is, and temporarily they may find relief, but in a short amount of time, a feeling or a discomfort or a pain or a reaction will show up in another part of their body. Why? Why does this happen? Because the cause hasn't been dealt with. And the cause is based around your two bodies, which are mental and emotional. Okay. And I'm a big believer in the fact that it's the emotions that cause the physical body to be what it is today. Right. And if it's cutting out guys, I apologize for that. Uh, third world country, uh, you know, internet sometimes can be hit or miss, but there will be a post video on Facebook and on YouTube. So don't you worry. So understand that, the water balloon effect. Please don't be partaking in this kind of world. Uh, it's very, very important that we move towards cause and not symptom. Number three is the spider web effect. The spider web effect says negative, catastrophic, and pessimistic thinking uh, attaching itself to more and more of the same types of perceptions. So, you know, you'll see the spider web effect where um, it goes one thought connects to another thought, to another thought, to another thought, to the point where you're going, holy smokes, right? Jesus, this is so overwhelming, right? It's turning emotional. I can't deal with this anymore. You know, why won't this just go away? Why do I feel like this, All right? So the, if you're partaking in the spider web effect, it's very important that you understand how to respond within the first few moments of that initial thought showing up. And in order for this to happen, you've got to backtrack a little bit and say, you know what, where do my fears begin? When you wake up in the morning, a lot of people start to engage in the spider web effect right away. That's a perfect time to begin responding instead. If you go on YouTube and look up NLP anxiety guide techniques, you'll find five very powerful techniques there that will help you to respond so that you can halt the process of the spider web effect taking place. Next thing you know, the spider web effect is happening in a positive tense instead, in a positive manner, and that's what we want. Um, so I hope that metaphor makes sense. First one was the slow train. Second one was the water balloon effect. Third one was the spider web effect. The fourth metaphor when it comes to anxiety and the transition is the plane ride. Holy smokes, this was one that daily for me, literally daily, the plane ride, you know, sufferers will go on a plane. Like for example, just picture this for, for a moment and see how it relates to what you're going through right now. Think about being on a plane and most people are fearful of turbulence, for example, or discomfort, right? As they're on the plane. As soon as the turbulence happens, you know, the worst possible scenarios start showing up in their minds, pictures, this and that. Uh, when in fact planes are, you know, safer than cars these days, if you look at the, the, the facts and the studies. But in any case, um, you're on a plane and there is turbulence, very similar to a sufferer going through the day and experience internal turbulence. Internal turbulence, like physical symptoms, mental symptoms, emotional symptoms, and imaginative symptoms, what's going to take place in the future, seeing those pictures and movies vividly, right? So the plane ride recognizes the turbulence, but when the turbulence stops, whether that be on a plane or off a plane, as you're going through the day, what starts to happen in an anxiety sufferer's mind? What happened to the turbulence? Right? Why, why are my symptoms not there? 
Are they going to come back even stronger next time? Is, is, is this the end of my life? This feels really strange right now. Right? Nothing's a, I feel like I'm in a pleasant place, but it's really disturbing. Comment below if this makes sense, if, the, if you can relate to this metaphor. So the unfamiliar causes the anxiety, and the familiar causes the anxiety. Because a person is stuck, unconsciously stuck, within the addiction to suffering. And as long as a person is stuck in the addiction to suffering, they'll be stuck within the addiction to control. When there's turbulence on the plane or off the plane, turbulence internal, there's a sense of losing control. When the person feels healthy and pleasant, there's a sense of control. There's a sense of losing control because it's unfamiliar. Right? So again, we have to decide where we want to live. It really starts there. It starts with where you want to live internally. Who do you want to be? What kind of thought processes, patterns, style do you want to begin partaking in? Right? So I hope you can relate to the plane ride metaphor. Because I know I can. A couple people can. Mirza says, oh yeah. Um, Lisa's saying conjuring up new stuff. Yep. Transitional limbo. Yep. Totally. Yes, absolutely. So there's a lot of people there that can relate. Started the Ending Anxiety program a few weeks ago. It has been incredible. Which, awesome. Which part about it, Andrew? Is it the gray rooms? Is it the magic frames? Which part? I'm really curious about the program that you feel is contributing to your healing the most. Um, final metaphor. Final metaphor. First of all, guys, give your body a bit of a shake right here, right now. Shake it off, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Sometimes when you sit too much, you're listening to a guy with a toque, you know, you kind of go, oh, that, 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 that guy, I that, get it, I'm trying to keep track. You know, it can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes, right? Especially with the new information coming in. But shake it off, shake off the stuff, you know, jump up and down if you want to right here, right now. Do a couple jumping jacks, right? Go get yourself some tea. We're hanging. We're hanging. Good. Final metaphor is the sleaze bag dancer. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> sleaze bag dancer, you say? Okay. Well, let's say, and this this relates to thinking. This relates to thinking. You have your wife, and this is the, not everybody would react this way, but. I think maybe I would. You have your wife dancing with a sleaze bag, right? And you're going, what the heck is going on there, right? Maybe she's a little bit um, drunk. Maybe she had too many drinks for whatever reason. She's dancing with a sleaze bag, okay? And you're watching them going, that's not right. The sleaze bag has everything to do with your normal ways of thinking, right? Now, let me ask you, would you stand there and just continue to watch them dancing? Or would you do something that gets you in between that dance, right? Would you do something to break up what's currently going on there so that there can be a separation? We need to understand that it's within the moments of sensitivity where you have the biggest opportunity to go in a different direction. It's in the moments of sensitivity, the moment where you're consciously aware of the fear, the moment where you're consciously aware of the emotion or the bodily symptom or the image that just played up in your head over what's gonna take place in the meeting later on and you might make a fool out of yourself that image that just showed up. Whatever it is, it's in that exact moment that you have an opportunity to go in a different direction. If you continue to do the same reactive patterns that you've been partaking in for quite some time, you're gonna get the same result. So it's totally up to you 
to recognize the moment. First, you have to be conscious of it. First, you have to have awareness over it and get in the way. Okay, learn the techniques and the skills that will get you in the way so that that dance doesn't continue. We don't want anyone, any sleaze bag, to be dancing with someone that we love. Get in the way. So, metaphor number one, the slow train that emphasizes the transition from the old to the new. Metaphor number two is the water balloon effect, which emphasizes a person focusing too much on the symptoms rather than the cause, okay? Metaphor number three, the spider web effect, where you allow your thoughts to go from one thought to the other, right, eventually turning into a mood. Metaphor number four is the plane ride, where you're on a plane and you haven't decided who you wanna be, I'm gonna live in peace or I'm gonna live in fear, that kind of thing, and you're uncomfortable with the turbulence, internal, external, as well you're uncomfortable with the healing, the good health, you need to decide. And metaphor number five is getting in the way of your thinking patterns, your normal ways of reacting and responding instead. Comment below. Let me know that you guys got this. Which metaphor stuck out to you the most? Which metaphor stuck out to you the most? Which one gave you an aha kind of moment? Whoa, I never saw it from that angle before. That's a new perspective. Which one, right? Snezhi is saying the plane ride. And many times when you run into these metaphors and these deeper ways of understanding what you're going through, a change tends to happen quite quickly, right? Very good. Lisa, dealing with the physical symptoms, recognizing that the water balloon effect is overtaking her days. Okay, good stuff. You write those down because they're very, very important, guys. Cobweb. <laughs> Good stuff. Water balloon and sleeves bag. Good stuff, good stuff. And just so I'm aware, make sure that everybody, or as many people as possible, has a buddy because we're starting the buddy system ASAP. Okay, we're starting the buddy system now. I will go over it again in the end, okay? But please make sure you have your buddy. Questions. Before we get into reframing, questions. If anybody has any kind of questions at the moment that I can answer, let's go into our Q&A now, okay, so that um, we can get into reframing and we don't have to do Q&A after. Dawn needs a buddy, go ahead. Suzanne said the spider web because my mind runs away first thing in the morning until I get in the way of it. Nick and Andra connecting, I like it. Dawn and Mirza connecting, I like it. I like that people are proactive in their healing, not waiting and hoping that train or the, the chain shows up. Matt says, trains are a great example of the importance of patience while slowing down. Tons of momentum that has built over time. Yes, tons, Matt, exactly. Thank you, Dennis. Confused on the buddy system. We'll go over it in the end um, as well. If it's still, you know, you still got question marks, post video, Lori. Um, as well, if you grab a buddy right now, they'll probably explain to you exactly what it is. You can start that conversation on a separate message right now when you message privately to that person. Dennis, please tell me why intrusive thoughts can make us feel that we are dying. Well, well, it's not really the thoughts that make you feel like you're dying. You know, it's the emotions that make you feel like you're dying. It's the images in your head that are making you feel like you're dying. The thoughts are just a result of those emotions and those images. Um, the emotions and the images are, are uh, the languages of the subconscious mind. And the thinking many times as a result of those things. The spider web effect starts to continue. Now, anything can make you feel 
like anything in your life. Now the question is, these thoughts have been reoccurring and such a pattern in your life for so long up to now. I found a lot of comfort in shifting my perceptions over the deeper meaning around these thoughts. Many times my thoughts, you know, and then and this is a subcomponent to the to the bigger idea, were based around the fear of dying. And the fear of dying was connected to the fear of living. There was a lot of fear and there wasn't any love, right? So these intrusive thoughts and these patterns that were overtaking my psyche and overtaking my emotions and my spirit were based on me looking for answers that I couldn't find consciously. So here I am looking for the answers, looking for the answers, looking for the answers. And with all that looking, I found that I was overdoing my healing, right? I was doing too much. I was listening to way too many videos or I was reading way too many books. I know you're supposed to read books, but I, was, I wasn't reading those books to gain insight. I was reading those books so that I could just quickly heal quick enough. Maybe something, you know, a switch will go off. But like I mentioned earlier, um, when we can find that we are becoming more disinterested in one, um, in the fearful thoughts, and we become more interested in the loving thoughts, many times the perceptions over everything else tends to change. Um, yeah, I hope that touches on those things a little bit. I feel like death is closer than life because of actual bodily symptoms. So did I. So did I. Right? Because if you look at the news, if you look at Google, if you look at any search engines, if you look at 99.9% .9 of the support groups out there, um, you'll find that there's a lot of, lot of doom and gloom. Right? Is this physical symptom that? I really feel like this is the moment. I feel like this panic attack will lead me to this or whatever it is. When we can change our interpretations of these symptoms, we find healing though. Because people that get caught up and people that have created a pattern based around believing their first assumptions. You know when you get that bodily symptom and the first thing that comes to your mind is death, right? If we can just take a few moments in that moment, right, to allow the first couple of assumptions to fade away, what tends to happen? Well, what tends to happen is this way, this bigger picture thinking starts to show up. All of a sudden, we recognize that those bodily symptoms aren't connected to anything physically wrong with us. But those bodily symptoms are connected to messages being brought forward from our inner child that doesn't feel comfortable in this or a future situation, okay? So the bodily symptom needs to be seen as a signal, as a message, as a statement. It cannot be seen as a physical illness because if it does, what's gonna happen is you're gonna continue to convince yourself and not only yourself, you're gonna convince everybody else that you're sick. You're physically sick, which means you're emotionally sick, right? We can't have that happen in this group. We can't have that happen in this tribe. We have to look deeper than that. And we have to treat, at least to some extent, we have to treat our symptoms, whether that be mental, emotional, or physical, or imaginative, as if we're a detective and we're detecting what we couldn't detect before, okay? People are here, I mean, you see it in Sneja, you see it in Michael, you see it in Jum, you see it in a lot of people here, and I know these people well at this point. You know, Michael, Matt, you know, I, I've seen their progress, I've seen what they're capable of, Andra, James, I, you know. These people, Jennifer even, going through the program, um, these people have been detectives in their own healing. These people have learned how to respond in the moment of fear. 
These people have been getting to a place where they believe they can and do reframe past events. They understand that there are two parts to them, the adult and the child. The adult doesn't get much say. Many times throughout the day, it's the child that runs the day. But if we allow the child to run the day, we're going to be very dissatisfied with our lives. So the adult must intervene with what the child is saying, and the child speaks through your symptoms. Love you too, Lori. With that said, I always love Matt's comments. Thinking as if goes, thinking as if goes both ways. You can choose to think as if you are healthy and healing, and others will pick up on that as well. Exactly, it's an it's, it's a chain of events. It's an energetic chain. Right? When you start to shift you, you tend to perceive other people differently, but you energetically affect other people differently as well. Right? So that really is living in a whole new dimension, right? a whole new level of consciousness when you get to that place. Because this level, this low vibration place that a lot of people live in with anxiety and depression and stuff, isn't where you should be living. Right? This isn't where you're supposed to be living. Okay, we shouldn't be walking around with this amount of fear. It's, it's, it's not true to our true nature. Okay, and if you go, and I did this for many years, if you go into nature and you sit there for a couple hours and you, you know, and you just begin studying, just begin studying nature, you're going to find many, many lessons that you can take in towards your own healing. Three pages of notes, Jennifer. Jeez. Give it up. I don't think anybody's going to beat that. Well, maybe they are. Comment below if, you're, if you've got more notes than Jennifer tonight. That's a lot of notes. Good. Eddie, you're very welcome. Calmed way down since you found this group. I love it. I love it. And... I, I, we, one more thing, I really want people to be patient with the new Facebook group because there's going to be sometimes people coming in there and not really familiar with our plan, our mission, right? So we need to be patient with those people as well. We need to come from a loving place. In fact, my motto each and every day is with love, okay, with love, okay? If, you know, I get criticized, I respond with love. If I have a bodily symptom, I respond with love. If I feel overwhelmed, I respond to myself with love. If someone criticizes me, I respond with love. Okay? And I, I promise you, if you can make this habitual, your life is going to change. We'll need to rewatch. Well, let's do something here. Okay? And let's, let's, uh, let's get into a reframing process that I really like to do um, in my own sessions from time to time. Very powerful. One of the first things you want to make sure that you, Matt, that coming from you, it means a lot, man. It really does. Um, the insights. Let's promise ourselves a couple of things. Okay, so pens down. Put your pens down, papers down. Um, let's promise ourselves that if any emotions want to show up, they show up and they become discharged through crying, laughing, uh, sweating, whatever your body wants to do throughout the reframing process, you allow it to do that. I want you to be, uh, to give yourself permission to be fully absorbed and playful in what you're about to do, okay? Because that holds the key to our healing when it comes to reframing. I want you to be an investigator, I want you to be a detective, and I want you to allow yourself to make those pictures and those movies as vivid as you possibly can. Okay? So as we're reframing, I want you to take a few moments, close your eyes, and as you close your eyes, I want you to take a few deep breaths. And as you take those deep breaths, I want you to do as best a job you can to let go of everything, okay? As you take those deep breaths and your eyes are closed at this point, 
I want you to let go of who you need to be, what you need to do, the amount of notes that you need to take, this, that, let everything go. Let the future go, let the past go, and just listen. All you have to do is listen. And as you do that, I want you to focus on your eyelids, and as you focus on your eyelids, I want you to let your eyelids go. And as you let your eyelids go, I want you to notice how relaxing that is. I want you to notice how much strain and tension you've been putting on those eyelids for quite some time. And then I want you to recognize that that level, that high level of relaxation is flowing up to the top of your head and all the way down to the tips of your toes. And if there's any parts of your body that you feel you're holding tension in, go ahead and let that tension go. Let it be released from your system now. And in this moment, as you trust that beautiful intuitive, intuitive side of you, as you trust that voice deep down within you that has all the answers to all the questions that you have, I want you to go ahead and recognize where in your body you're storing the fear. Where in my body am I storing the fear? And as you recognize where in your body you're storing that fear, I want you to recognize what color is associated to it. I want you to recognize whether it's a hot or cold feeling. I want you to recognize if it feels heavy or light. And I want you to go with your first impression that asks, how old was I when I first felt so much overwhelm? and freezing sensations based around the situation that was happening. How old was I when I first felt this level, this high level of fear and discomfort? Go with your first impression, whatever your system tells you. And then I want you to recognize, in that overwhelming moment, am I inside or am I outside? Am I in a room? Or am I outside somewhere? And then I want you to recognize whether it's light or dark in that environment. Is it light or is it dark? I want you to notice what colors you recognize around you. I want you to recognize who's around you, which people contributed to this fear, this level of fear. Who were the people, who were the players that had everything to do with the overwhelm that you felt in that moment. And in this moment, I want you to notice that you're looking in on all of that as the adult you, the all-knowing adult you, the intelligent, the rational, the logical adult you, looking in on the younger version of you. Go ahead, take a look looking in on the other people, looking in on everything from the outside. Notice the environment, notice the situation. And go ahead and begin walking towards the younger version of you and as you get closer and closer, notice what you're feeling. Notice the energy that's emanating from the younger version of you. Notice the emotions that are emanating from the younger version of you. Notice what you start to feel. What is that younger version of you feeling right now, right here? You get a very good sense of what's going on in that child. That's right. I want you to take your arms as the adult and I want you to wrap your arms around that child right now. Give that child, that teenager, whatever it is, Give that younger version of you exactly what he or she needed in that moment. The biggest hug he or she has ever received. And whatever emotions and feelings want to come up because of that hug, you go ahead and embrace it and you let it flow out of you right now. Give that younger version of you exactly what he or she needed in those moments of fear, in those moments of overwhelm. He or she wasn't a mistake. 
tell that younger version of you that it's not their fault. Tell them that they're not a mistake. Tell them that they're stronger than he or she thinks. Tell them that this is nothing more than a learning opportunity. Stay with that hug now. Moving your hands up and down the back of that younger version. That's right. Notice how badly he or she needed it. I want you to grab the hand of the younger version of you now. And as you do, I want you to go ahead and walk towards the person that has everything to do with your conditioning, your anxious conditioning, your fears. Walk towards the person that may have conditioned you consciously and unconsciously, that programmed you, who did things, who said things, who taught you things that made you feel more scared. And as you walk up to that person, I want you as the adult to look into the eyes of the younger version of you and say, this is your opportunity. You get to say and do whatever you want to say and do in this moment to that person. You get to discharge anything that you've been holding on to for far too long. Go ahead and do that now. Say what you wish you would have said to that person in that moment. Do what you wish you would have done to that person in that moment. This is your moment to let go of this fear, to let go of this program, this conditioning for good. Get angry. Get dissatisfied. And tell them that they can keep these ideas to themselves. And that you're not going to take these ideas and make them your own anymore. Walk up to another person. Say and do what you wish you would have said and done back then. Release the emotions that you need to. Release the language, the actions, everything you need to do in that moment, right now. That courageous, young child. That brave child. That's right. How proud the adult is looking down at that child now. And ask yourself, is there anything that the child needs right here, right now? in order to feel even safer in that situation. What does the child need to feel even safer? As the adult, go ahead and provide that to the child now. Do you need to walk out? Do you need to go to a safer place? Do you need to play? Do you need a scoop of ice cream for what you just did? Is there anything else that you need to do to feel safer. Do that now. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. You are not fear. You are not hesitation. You are not sensitivity. You are not anger. You are pure and utter love. And in this loving and safe moment with the adult and the younger version of you. I want you to take a picture. Take a picture so that whenever you remember this past event, this past situation, you'll remember it in a way that serves you rather than hurts you. That's right. Be one with that picture now. Think about the safest color that comes to mind. If you could wrap yourself around this color, you'd feel so safe and even empowered. I want you to go ahead and place 
that color around the frame of that picture now and begin breathing in that color in that picture to that part of your body where you used to hold the fear. Breathe in that color and breathe out the old color now. As you breathe in that color in that picture, notice that you feel more and more empowered. Notice that you feel more and more free. Notice that you feel more and more courageous and clear than you've ever felt before. Breathing out that color, breathing out the old program, the old conditioning, allow it to fade. That's right, like a cloud fading away, getting farther and farther and farther until it completely pops, disappears for good. That's right. And as you continue breathing in that color, go ahead and say, this is the real me. I accept this new identity into me now. I'm no longer going to play this limbo between fear and love. I choose love. And as you choose love, I want yourself to make a commitment today. A commitment that says, anything that furthers my healing, I will embrace. I will add on to anything that holds me back in terms of thoughts, feelings, actions, pictures. I will be disinterested in. I make myself that promise here and now. And when I count to five, I want you to open up your eyes. And when you do, there's going to be a lesson that you're going to take from this. I want you to write that lesson down. I want you to share it in the comment section so you can be proud of that lesson, whatever it may be. Go with your gut. Don't think it up. Go with your feelings. One, two, three, four, and five. You can open up your eyes, feeling lighter and lighter as this day and night progresses. Being prouder and prouder that you could do something like this with some guy you barely know who has a toucan looking at you in a Facebook Live. I'm proud of you for embracing the uncertainty of it all. I'm so proud of you for embracing the discomfort that comes with these types of exercises. Comment below on your greatest lesson. Hit the like button, hit the love button if you want more of these types of sessions in the future. Every like, every love shows me that we're all on the same page. That's right. We're all on the same page. Every one of us are connected. When one heals, the other heals. When one verbalizes their progress, another one jumps on board. When one talks too much or speaks too much about things that are going wrong in their lives, Many times I can bring other people down. So we talk about our progress and we continue to do the inner work. Sneji's lesson. Thank you for being honest, guys. For I gave my parents because they did their best at the time. Wow. Michael needed to speak up and say no. Mirza says yes. Lisa says I survived it all and no matter what, I am a strong warrior. Powerful lesson, Cynthia says, a session, the closure I needed. Colby gave the 17-year-old me the biggest hug that he needed on the night of mom's passing. Don't be tearing me up, man. Sorry, everyone, I could not do this in the environment that I am in. Do it later. Do it later. Excellent. This proved to me, I love Jennifer's feedback, this proved to me, and this is great for everyone, that if it wasn't just my dad, it was my mom as well. So hard though, because she was raised in foster homes and didn't know what family really was, so I'm learning to forgive her. My dad and I will never forgive my dad and, oh, okay. Get to a better place. Because until you do forgive, you can't move forward. Until you let go of any guilt, blame, 
and forgiveness that needs to be there, you can't move forward. It has to be there, not for anybody else's sake, but for your sake. Warriors, we smiled, we laughed, some of us cried, all good stuff during these Facebook Lives. The buddy system, which I'm gonna emphasize more and more in the Facebook members group. If you haven't joined the members lounge on Facebook, get there now, join it now, okay? They're all like-minded, progress-based people. Tears as always, but why am I yawning? Yawning is a form of emotional discharge, Anita. It's just like crying. Yawn away, okay? Your body is releasing all that repressed emotion. The stuff that you've been holding on to, harboring for far too long. Michael cried, and you know what? I love it. I love it. I love that you can be honest, crying, yawning, like I mentioned in the beginning, sweating. Whatever your body wants to do, do it. Because that's its way of releasing the stored stuff that you want to get rid of. Okay? Okay. So great stuff, Michael. Great stuff, everybody. I'm so, so proud of you. Buddy system. Find a buddy in the comments section. Find a buddy in the members lounge. I will be putting up a post that is an announcement on the Facebook lounge, uh, Facebook members lounge on this. Find that person, meet up at the same time every night and share the successes around your thinking from the day. Share your successes around your verbal communication with people from the day and the new words that you use with them. Share the changes in your physiology, the changes that you made with your body, speed, posture, breathing, facial expressions, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, walking with a limp because you're feeling so confident. Mm, sharing that one. Right? Whatever it is, share it up. Buddies, find me. Mirza needs a buddy. I need everybody here to take this seriously. Okay, the buddy system is valuable, is a valuable tool for our healing. Anita, you are welcome. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the loves. You are all so much more than anxiety. Don't ever forget it. If you have any questions on my programs, go to theanxietyguy.com. Continue your healing. Start the programs. I love you all from the bottom of my heart. Know that. Know that. And like I mentioned before, we are a tribe. We are outcome focused. We will build this. If you believe that other people need this, what we discussed today, please share this Facebook Live with other people. Share the content, YouTube with other people. Share the website, share, 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 because I believe that the more proper and practical information that people need, the faster they're gonna to get to the roots of their resistance and the causes to their anxiety. This is where we're going. I love you all. Sherry, Colby, Michael, Mirza, James, Sally, Anita. Awesome. Jennifer, I'm so proud of you. Lori, I'm so proud of you. Keep it up. Have a wonderful weekend. I love you all. Bye, guys.